Check. One, two, three. The D. Three. 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 This is the D. Three. Go. Your guide to Detroit. Your guide to Detroit's arts, arts and entertainment scene. This is the D. Three. Hello and welcome to The Debrief. I'm Seth Ressler. And I'm Becky Scarcello. And on today's show, we have the president and CEO of Axel Brewing Company and Ferndale's Livernoy Tap. So Axel Brewing Company started back in the fall of 2015, started making beer, and then they opened up the tap room, Livernoy Tap, over there in Ferndale in June of 2017. Prior to that, he wasn't making beer. No. Spent 20 years <laughs> in the media industry. Please welcome Dan Riley. Hi, guys. How are you today? Good. 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 That's a career switch right there. What uh, inspires that? It was fairly dramatic. I guess so. You know, I, I spent the better part of uh, about 13 years with Time Inc., the magazine publishing division. And um, around 2014, they had announced they were spinning the division off into a separate company. And uh, I was a managing director here, had a fantastic run, but had a unique contractual opportunity to uh, to spend some time with my family. I had a three-year-old son at the time. Yep. And I uh, was spending a lot of time in New York and L.A. and New Orleans and Toronto and mm-hmm. had a really interesting professional life but was not spending enough time at home. With the family, yeah. 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 I, know, I know that feeling. So, mm-hmm. Well, and so why beer? Yeah. How'd you, how'd you get started on that? <laughs> right. A, a strange, happy accident. I actually uh, I spent the first year after I left Time, Inc., as a consultant, I did a lot of work in public media with some Detroit-based nonprofits, um, particularly with WDET. Um, mm-hmm. My non-compete didn't allow me to compete in commercial media, but they failed to mention uh, nonprofit media. Ah. So it uh, gave me an opportunity to work with some great artists and, and people. I did a lot of executive, executive coaching and organizational behavior work. And uh, a friend of mine who is involved in the private equity space Basically, had brought, bought the assets of a really distressed brewery, and uh, he and I were having lunch to talk about something entirely different. And he said, "Hey, can you help me out with this?" So it started as kind of a consulting conversation, uh-huh. kind of uh, became something very different. So what? Wait, <laughs> <laughs> it's but, not like the super sexy origin story of you know. But were you brewing? Uh, do you have a role in the brewing? No, are you nope. so so. What is your? I'm a suit. You are. A I am a suit. <laughs> okay. Without a question. I know people giggle at that because I don't look like one anymore. But no, uh, fundamentally, I you know I run the business and branding side. Um, I've really talented talented head brewer. Um, I was always a craft beer, you know, someone who enjoyed it. I'm also a wine guy, and I'm a food guy. I'm like literally the trading card collector of restaurants, chefs. It's my passion. It's Mm -hmm. what I really love to do. So kind of like putting all that together, I mean, fundamentally, I'm a marketing, branding, organizational guy. Um, You know, I got to work for amazing brands. I spent a lot of time at People Magazine and Essence and Entertainment Weekly. I worked at National Geographic in the 90s. So this is, you know, the first opportunity to essentially build a brand. And so, yeah, I enjoy the beer experience, but I'm not a home brewer. I'm not Mm. a professional brewer, much to sometimes the joy of my brewing team and the chagrin. Right, right. Depends on the day. Right, right. So when you step into that role, what is step one? Do you have to go find a brewer? Was that the first thing? Yeah, we, we initially inherited someone who wasn't a great fit. And so, yeah, I mean, I started um, talking to some people and we did everything. We we jokingly say we took the long cut everywhere. Um, Our flagship IPA is called the long cut, partly because it's a reference to the Uncle Tupelo song, the long cut. Oh, sure. Um, Very much the opposite of shortcut. Um, So we actually, we brewed beer. We put it out in the market uh, in terms of package and draft before we had a physical tap room, before we had a brand. We were essentially, there was a lot of confusion in the marketplace about were we, you know, were we new, were we the an acquisition of somebody else? So we started looking. We knew that we wanted a physical tap room that was going to kind of be a little bit of a game changer in the space. So um, we started looking for, for kind of having casual conversations with brewers and kind of just a good, happy accident. Uh, one of my investors met a guy who was a consultant in the brewing industry who knew a guy that he felt like needed a, a little bigger stage. And so that's how I met Adam Beretta, who's our head brewer and has been with us for going on three years. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So now, did you inherit the Axel name as well, or it was no. something else? Okay. No. Um, you know, my 
my partners had originally um, they had originally incorporated the company as AXL Holding, and they were a little bit attached to it. And when mm. I got on board, I was like, "No, nah, that's not going to work. Mm. Looks and smells like Axe body spray." <laughs> um, but there was no, something, no. you know, of Detroit, you know, and it was early in the alphabet, alphabetically. And so I said, all right, you know, here's the deal. We, in exchange for all creative control of all the assets, we're going to add an E and I'm going to try to work with this and we're going to try to build around it. Ah. So, yeah, it's a very different um, than most things end up happening. Um, and in a weird way, it kind of uh, it tested us a little bit to get very creative. Right. I bet. So when you sit there and set out the vision for, you know, what Axel Beer is, mm -hmm. you know, how do you envision that and where does it fit in the overall landscape? Mm -hmm. I think for us, um, the biggest thing was creating a taproom experience because fundamentally for me that that is step one. And we had obviously Even had... Even though it wasn't it your wasn't first step. step no, no. So we, we ended up working backwards a little bit. So we, we jokingly say we were... Uh, you know, founded in 2015 and rooted in 2017. Ah. Um, so we found the space, the building in Ferndale, and it was on Livernois between 8 and 9. And it was for me, you know, uh, my friends and I cycle down Livernois on our way downtown. I live in Pleasant Ridge. I grew up at Six Mile and Evergreen in Detroit. Um, my dad used to run at a fire station uh, down at Livernois and Curtis. He was a, he's a retired fire chief from the city. And so there was a, just a lot of kismet and karma around that kind of, you know, intersection of what's happening at Livernois Six Mile and in a lot of the neighborhoods south of 8 and downtown Ferndale. And it just felt like a really natural fit. Um, the building didn't have a lot of uh, redeeming qualities. <laughs> it was an old tool and die shop. And truthfully, people say, well, what was the, why did you, what was the allure? I'm like, the setbacks from the street the location on the street, and, you know, it had really good light in the evening. Wow, because I'm trying to think what else is there. There's a flower shop or florist or something. Yeah, like a, friend, a friend of mine actually and... bought that florist a year ago, someone I knew in high school. Right. Ah. Um, there's some galleries. Um, a gym. And a gym new. and a boutique. And it kind of, um, it reminded me of a lot of the just slightly off the beaten path spaces that a lot of craft brewers have, have been able to develop and kind of change the scope of neighborhoods. Now, yes. One of the things that I think is great about the location, and I don't know if it was there when you moved in, it's the bike lanes on that street. Well, there was, there definitely was um, initially, um, and that kind of what, you know, that attracted us a little bit. Uh, we did go through a hellish resurfacing pro pro project last oh, yeah. uh, summer for five that months. That was brutal. Where mm -hmm. they moved the bike lanes out, so they're not curbside. Um, they're a little more contemporary design. But for us, it, it's a big part of what we do. I mean, we are kind of a hub for cycling groups and a lot of people in the neighborhood. So kind of we, we started building around this concept. For, for me, there's, there's a, a Jim Harrison quote that f sits on our wall prominently that says, the answer is always in the entire story, not just a piece of it. And so I feel like we had a couple pieces of it initially. But until you kind of have that comprehensive experience... Um, particularly in our space, you can't really express what the brand is. You can you can kind of say it, but until people have a physical kind of visceral connection, you're not a brand. Um, you're just something. And so for us, you know, I, I really wanted to create something that kind of had a contemporary feel, but also kind of took a lot of inspiration from the more collegial, family-friendly beer halls um, in Europe, some design and aesthetic cues from tap rooms I had seen on the West Coast and a little bit on the East Coast and kind of a little more aspirational in terms of design and food execution. I just felt like we had a unique opportunity to, to kind of do everything and to create kind of an engaged community space that embraced our brand values and also kind of fit in the community we were working in. Talk a little bit about the physical space for people who haven't been there, because when you walk in, it doesn't have the feeling of like a dark old English pub kind <laughs> not of at thing. All. Like not, not a lot of re opposite. reclaimed wood and heavy right. metal imagery. <laughs> not that no. there's anything wrong with it. Every other tap room. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I mean, I think um, we worked with Patrick Thompson Design um, in Detroit, who's he's he's a really close personal friend. 
And I think we, we did. We want to capture kind of like spirit of that European beer hall. There's some spaces in Montreal that we love. And so it's a lot of light woods. Um, it's bright. It's got an industrial feel, but um, my partner, Carolyn, um, was really adamant that it didn't feel cold. It had some warmth. It had some feminine Tense. touches. And truthfully, that was a bit of a guiding principle for us is that the overriding thing that I think people feel is that tap rooms are incredibly masculine in terms of design, yep. vibe, staff. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that, you know, there's kind of, um, I wouldn't call our design and packaging feminine per se, but it's definitely not s super hyper bro or masculine. Right. And right, that was right. really important to us in the design elements and also just bringing kind of light in. And a communal kind of setup, but not like, you know, not like everybody else. There's a great outdoor space. I love how it flows. Yeah, that, then all the that was, uh, that was probably the biggest, like when we saw it, we thought, God, if the city would let us open a beer garden that faced forward. Because mm. you think about every outdoor space in Metro Detroit. It's in the back. It's pretty much in the back. And so if we thought we could have something adjacent to the building that ran up to the sidewalk, essentially... Um, it would be incredibly inviting, not just for us, but for the area mm -hmm. because there's a ton of development proposed. There's also housing stock is changing dramatically, tons of young families moving in. So we just felt like that would create kind of a really inviting kind of space. Yeah, it does. It does. <coughs> um, can you talk a little bit more about your food? I think that definitely sets you apart. You don't just have the pretzels and yeah. the chips and yeah. In fact, we, um, we had the opportunity to meet your chef, Jacob yeah. at, uh, the empty bowls event at Easter market. We were right next to him. He was serving the French onion soup. That was yeah. good soup. That was really good. It was the first one we tried. And that was, it was, it was fueled by a, by a 13% Baltic this, porter that had yes, been aged the in porter. oak. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely had a, a, a backbone. Mm -hmm. Um, essentially, you know, one of the things Part of it is just a selfish personal thing. You know, I'm a food guy and I love food. And um, You knew you'd be spending a lot of time there. Yeah. So. <laughs> and initially we worked with um, – we were really close friends with the guys who own Grey Ghost. And so initially the chefs from Grey Ghost worked with us to kind of design the menu. And they were really involved in managing our kitchen the first year. And they brought a lot of things. They brought like a level of credibility and kind of market awareness that – kind of changed the game for us a little bit from a PR standpoint. But also we just, you know, I think we didn't want to do pizza, mm -hmm. you know, the $8 medium well cheeseburger yeah. and nachos. So we jokingly say it's inspired beer food, but, you know, it's also we, we laugh a little bit and say it's like stoner food made by guys who went to culinary school. <laughs> That makes sense. <laughs> you know? And the, the, menu, sense. the menu has evolved over time. Jacob's been on board of a, as our executive chef since December, but he's been with us uh, about a year and a half. And so he's started to put his own stamp on things. There's a few things that, you know, are never going to change. The lamb burger, the shawarma wings, the cheese curds. Um, you know, there's something you might find an iteration of in another brew pub or bar and grill but not the same execution. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. And, you know, we, we try to evolve a little bit seasonally. And then we do some funky things, you know, specials and pop-ups. Yeah, you've you had know. some cool events like uh, Andalisi's event with the the big, I think there were four chefs, yeah. James Regato. And well, that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I, I love kind of the base template of what we do. It's a big space. It's a big beer hall. Um, we are huge supporters of public radio. Um, we're engaged with WDET. We help, you know, finance and build a public radio studio in Ferndale. And so we're also, you know, we're engaged with the chef community. And so I think that was a great idea that James Regato from Mabel Gray and John Vermiglio and Ann and I were kind of brainstorming. And so we've done things like that where we bring a bunch of chefs together to showcase their talents. That was a big um, barbecue. I think I told you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was a lot. That was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It was fun watching like all four of those chefs set up, you know, kind of on the outdoor space. And then Doug Hewitt, who is the chef at Chartreuse, who's just <laughs> amazing talent and also like a really, really chill guy. 
He was like set up in the corner of the parking lot. Yeah. And I was like, Doug, do you want to get any closer? He's like, no, I'm good. You know, (laughs) he's just, you know, he's a really special guy. So I think it's provided us the opportunity to have a lot of fun. We also sell our beers wholesale to, you know, a lot of restaurants, you know, kind of with food as a focus. I mean, Selden Standard has, I think, I'm not 100% positive, but I think Noble Ghost is one of two craft beers on their menu all the time um, on tap. So, you know, that's kind of part of the space we play in, um, and it's a lot of fun. It it provides a really open template. Where else can people find your beers? Restaurants and stores, too. All Yeah, all over um, Metro Detroit. Um, We also, we've been developing more specialty accounts outside of the um, metro area with a small boutique distributor called Oath. Um, so a little bit in Grand Rapids, a little bit in Ann Arbor, but very surgical, I would say, positioning. Is the goal ever to go beyond Michigan? Probably not. I think what you're seeing right now in the in the beer space is in there is definitely, without a doubt, a little bit of a bubble going on, um, particularly with like mid-sized regional players who are in multiple states. Because what you're seeing is more and more high quality hyper-local breweries opening up. And I think we're hearkening back to a time similar to like pre-prohibition where there were a ton of breweries in the neighborhoods. And so I think people are are really connected at the source. And so for us, the margins and, you know, in terms of broader distribution and scale, just really not there. And, um, Mm -hmm. The ramp up in the competitive, you know, landscape right now doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. For us, it's a much better business to sell most of our beer at the tap. Yeah. Well, well, I think we should try. Yeah, I yeah, do too. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> what do we got here? Um, what are you drinking? You're drinking a raspberry Jolene, which is – Jolene is our flagship wheat and mm-hmm. named affectionately for uh, the bank teller who caused, you know, Dolly Parton to have a considerable amount of jealousy, enough to write a song about yes, it. Yes, yes. Um, I've had the Jolene many times. Yeah, so. and this is uh, a batch we just made with a ton of fresh raspberries, and uh, we decided we were going to pull spring forward a little bit. Nice, nice. With his beer. Okay. And uh, you are, Seth, I think you're drinking the 14th Amendment. Yeah. Which is our uh, year-round Kolsch. It's a uh, traditional German-style Kolsch. And every a portion of the proceeds from every pint we sell goes to support um, Ferndale Pride and the LGBT community in Ferndale. Nice. All right. We get a lot of um, people. Mm. That was a great sound. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm a professional. Yeah. We, we, we do get occasional people in the tap room who correct us and tell us that the 21st Amendment was a repeal prohibition. And we're oh. like, yeah, we know. No. This, is, we, we, uh, this yeah. has more to do with the equal protection. Yes, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Which, you know, that, that was another thing that was really important to us was kind of engaging the community in a really intentional <laughs> way. and meaningful yeah. way. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about, you know, what you have on tap and, and what are the standards that are always going to be there? I think, um, you know, pretty much at the tap room and in distribution you'll see – we package the long cut, our flagship IPA. You'll see our, our double IPA, Mother Handsome. Um, you'll also see City Pale Ale through most of the year because that's a partnership we have with Detroit City Football Club. Oh, right, right. We're their craft beer partner. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's a real traditional American pale ale, a bit of an homage to Sierra. Um, and then uh, Noble Ghost, um, which is a Grungeist Blonde that is made with a German hop that's got a little bit of a peach note. That you'll see always in the tap room, and that's probably our biggest seller on draft outside of the tap room. Can I ask <clears> about IPA? Because mm-hmm. uh, what's going on with IPA? Because I've, I'm one of these guys who's like, <laughs> what's up with this? Well, I'm one of these guys who who just beer got really bitter. <laughs> oh yeah. yes, yeah, I'm not a fan of the and, real and, bitter. And, and so I've moved away from that. But but you know, has IPA because it feels like that's been the trendy beer for it years. is. Years, um, yeah. It's. Um, at one point, it was about 36%, 37% of the market. Wow. And of the craft beer market. Yeah. And I, I believe it probably the multiple incarnations of it still make up that. Okay. Whether it be Session, Hazy, New England. Mm-hmm. I think about <clears throat> probably about two years ago, a lot of us saw kind of the next move in, in American craft being 
crisp, clean, dry Pilsner's lagers. And you're seeing a lot of that on the West Coast and the East Coast. And then the kind of juicy haze uh, craze just really caught hold. And you were seeing a few brewers on the East Coast, some, you know, in Vermont, and then some on the West Coast. And then, you know, Travis Fritz uh, at Old Nation here in Michigan just really caught a tiger by the tail. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he just, he went all in. And um, he's traditionally a German-trained brewer who makes unbelievable lagers and and pilsners. And that was kind of his original objective. But I think he, he saw the writing on the wall. And um, so when he created M43, kind of created this <clears throat> kind of a Midwest version, which you know, typically the the New England styles, very hazy, made with flaked oaks. So they, they kind of have this like, you know, little bit thicker mouthfeel, but less bitterness and the hops are really juicy, you know, pronounced, a lot of citrus flavors. And in a way, it's kind of been a gateway craft beer um, for people who probably wouldn't normally drink craft right, beer. Right, right. Um, me personally, I, I tend to gravitate more towards a balanced kind of still clear, still dry. I like a little bit of bitterness, but not, you know, overwhelming. So I guess it's it's funny. We're seeing a new trend now where it's the brute style IPA. Sometimes they're made with champagne yeast. They tend to be very dry, mm -hmm. um, very crisp. Um, but we laugh a little bit because we used to just call them like San Diego style IPAs. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Chill. But I don't think I don't think IPAs in general are going anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. When I was in radio, you know, I'd work for a, a, an alternative rock radio station. We'd look at other alternative rock radio stations mm -hmm. in certain cities that were tastemakers mm -hmm. and that we knew were leading the way on playing new bands. Is there something similar that happens in craft beer? And if so, who are you looking at around mm -hmm. the country as tastemakers? W without a doubt. Um, I think it's a, on a couple levels. Um, I, I am not of craft brewing per se, so I tend to I tend to look at people that I, are aspirational in terms of their design, their messaging, kind of who they're on the marketplace, what they stand for, um, and I think there's like a there's a there's a lot of like trends and patterns that are pretty consistent in the craft beer industry over time. But I think now we're living in just a whole trend cycle, not just in, you know, food or, or consumer products, but, you know, the trends are fast. I mean, what used to take four or five years to kind of migrate from the coast is now a four or five month cycle. Right, right. Um, so there are, there are, one of the things I saw, I guess it's been almost four years, uh, was I think that Michigan was way behind in terms of design and packaging. And I think it's caught up quite a bit. Um, because there's a lot of just really old school, muddled, kind of really state, you know, same old, same old. Um, and so I, I looked a lot to the West Coast for inspiration. Modern Times in San Diego is someone I keep my eye on quite a bit. They, um, their CEO, Jacob McKeon, is a former CMO at Stone. And they do a lot of things really right. Their tap rooms are gorgeous. Their, um, their brands are really bright. Their designs are really edgy. Um, and I think what you've seen <clears throat> is kind of a better application of, of packaging and graphic design work. I also think that you see some really strong values-oriented brewers out there. And also, I, I tend to admire, you know, the brewers who do one thing and they do it really well, and they kind of stick to it. Because the other challenge right now in the marketplace, the consumer is really, really fickle. And that core kind of like 21 to 34-year-old you know, mainly male crap beer fish out. They just want what's new. Mm -hmm. They want what's brand new, brand new, brand new. Try the, and, try the latest and greatest. Yeah, and there's some trends, you know, there's a ton of lacto sugar in beers right now, the milkshake IPA trend, this and that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, without a doubt, um, I look at, like, Fieldwork in Berkeley um, has done a great job. There's an East Coast brewer, Lord Hobo, that is probably coming to Michigan soon that people should keep their eyes on. Um, I think... Um, you know, Great Notion in Portland is someone I, I watch a little bit where they do a ton of releases at their tap rooms. Um, but even in the marketplace, we were very good friends with the owners of Urban Rest, which is on the other mm -hmm. side of Ferndale. Uh, the Sellermans guys, we mm -hmm. collaborate with. We 
They make our cider and mead for us under bond because we have a small winemaker's license. Um, and it's interesting to watch what people are doing and how they're evolving because it is definitely, it is not a business for the faint of heart right now. Right, I can imagine. So many players. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask you beyond um, the beer and food, mm-hmm. you know, the mission of being in the community. I know you do um, rotating art exhibits, mm-hmm. for instance, and other community events. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that um, that was... Here, hold on a second. I gotta open you got to hold it up to the yeah, mic there. There you go. Oh, that was a good one. That was nice. That was nice. Don't, isn't there a button you're supposed to hit to do that? We're, uh, we're live with it. Yeah, this is real. <laughs> no, originally, you know, kind of the, you know, music is kind of at the core of our brand. And so, you know, a lot of you'll notice some of the brand names have like lyrical references and different things. And it, it, part of it is because, you know, I'm like a old school mixtape dork. Oh, yeah. You know, Love and, it. and so... um it's super important to me. And so the art and kind of music side of things and a little bit of literary is just kind of what infuses the brand. And so initially we had uh, Don Kilpatrick, who is the dean of illustration at CCS. He is a friend of a friend, and he agreed to do some mural work in the tap room. So a lot of the hand painting you see was was Don yes. and a guy named Joe Banghauser, who's his partner in Detroit Wood Type Company. Oh, yeah. And he's also the creative director at Carhartt. So they they did a lot of cool stuff. And so we had this one huge wall in the hallway. And frankly, it was a timing and budget thing. I'm like, I had this idea where I wanted them to create kind of like a a brewing-related version of the Diego Rivera murals. like, it, But we just ran out of time. So we have this giant white wall that goes from the brewery to the bathrooms. Mm-hmm. And we were in we were in like a brainstorm meeting and we were trying to figure out like, okay, what we, it's just a long giant hallway. It's driving me nuts. But it was kind of like when you move into a new house and you don't want to do everything right away. Right. You gotta live with it a little bit. Yeah. And so um one of the guys we were working with said, What if we just solicit we got all these local artists? What if we solicited them and we gave them like the gallery space? And so it was like, boom. I mean, uh, Jill, who handles our social media, put out an ask, and we had the year booked. And so it's been awesome. We we give them that space. They can do whatever they want with it. We have an opening for them at the beginning of the month, and then um, they can sell their pieces. And we don't, you know, we don't take a commission. We don't rent them the space. And some have killed it, absolutely killed it. And so... We've had some really interesting artists from all different walks of life. Um, we had a woman in November, Sari Rudin, who oh, she's moved, been on the podcast. Yeah, who's yep. moved from New York. She's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it was it was during the election, during the midterm, mm-hmm. so it was just timing wise, it was great. Um, yeah, we've been able to have to feature some pieces from you know like uh, Aaron Bratt whose wife, uh, Shelby, owns Long White Beard, the furniture store down the street. Right. She had our exhibit during Pride. She sold every single piece in, like, the first weekend. Wow. So it's been awesome. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, I hate to say it like this, but it's super easy. Well, sure. It's, yeah, yeah, It's yeah. great. We get, like, rotating art. Artists get exposure. They bring in, ten, chances are they bring in their friends. Yep. Some people who may not know about us, some people may be like, well, I'm not, like, a hardcore craft beer person. Which is another thing we we really try to be very approachable. I mean, no one likes to ever feel like they're dumb or not cool. And so one of the things we impress upon our staff is that you're there also to educate. So if someone comes to the bar and says, I normally drink Bud Light, don't like make them feel like a you know, like a jackass. Like (laughs) find a bridge. And we tend to our products do have multiple entry points. And it's our job to do that because ultimately if they find a craft beer that they really like and they know it's made 10 feet away, they're gonna get you know, it. maybe they won't order Bud Light anymore. Right, right. I appreciate, too, you do those um, beer cocktails with the shrubs and the different... Yeah. Ma- yeah. Beer tails. Beer right? tails. Yeah, it was, it was funny because that came up, you know, again, because we are, we're a brewer. We don't have a Class C liquor license, so we don't have liquor. We, <laughs> we can't do conventional cocktails. And um, so it came up as an idea, and initially... My concern was whether my brewer would feel like, you know, mm-hmm. somehow mm-hmm. compromised. But mm-hmm. he's been awesome about it. And, uh, 
you know, he loves the idea. And ultimately, it's about getting people more exposure. Right. So right. Um, the bartenders and our GM and our previous bar managers, they've all touched that program. And it's kind of an open source thing. So our latest one, we have a shandy with the raspberry jolene. This is delicious, by the way. Oh, my God. It's oh, so yeah. good. So springy and beautiful in color. And, and that was one of our barbacks. She was like, oh. you know what? I'd love it if this had a tart edge and yeah. started playing around with lemon juice. And so we have, you know, a shandy. So, I mean, the, the beer tail program has been really cool. We've done some fun stuff. And I, I appreciate, too, that someone that doesn't want as much alcohol <laughs> can keep up drink for drink. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's kind of like when I went to Oktoberfest and, like, whispering to the, the bartender, give me a shandy. You know, nobody knows that I'm it's, drinking half of the alcohol. You can't hang with me. It's and, just fine. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and that's part of the experience. I think, you know, we're, we're pretty family friendly and mm-hmm. we have – you know, we have a really crazy mix of people. Um, and that to me, when, when, we're, when we're busy on like a summer night and I see a mix of like families and, you know, a table full of guys and, you know, a bunch of people in their 50s, <clears throat> you know, from Palmer Woods hanging around and then some kids running around and, you know, a table full of bears over here. And it's just, it's, it, it's, that's kind of what we, we wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you about something. You know, I, I was doing research in your tap room mm-hmm. last week, which is <laughs> fun research to do. Yes. <laughs> Some of the best assignments. And I was uh, asking the bartenders what to ask you. And they said, one of the things that you talk about is the role of women in the craft beer industry. And mm-hmm. that's an issue you care about. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think, you know what, we um, we have obviously, you know, very strong, you know, female staff. And I think probably when I first looked at the industry, um, and it probably had to do with where I was coming from, um, you know, I'd worked on very female-centric brands at Time Inc. Um, and multicultural brands. And the first thing I saw, you know, in the craft beer industry was, Really, 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 really male focused branding, really male focused. Um, mm-hmm. And white, packaging. a lot of white dudes. Yes, absolutely. And so, <clears throat> you know, you, when you look at the basic Mintel research, if you're just looking at consumer consumption research, a huge growing area of adoption in craft beer are going to be females and also people of color. And I, you know, and it's a gross overstatement and generalization, but for the most part, I saw an industry that really wasn't talking to them in an authentic voice. Yeah. So I, I feel like there was kind of a culture where, you know, if if the ladies acted like, you know, the good old boys and they could kind of figure it out. And so for us, it's um, just being really conscious of, of how we name beers, how we characterize things and thinking about it from a different perspective. And um Yeah, it's really important. I mean, I I think it drives me nuts as a marketer and someone who spent a lot of time developing brands. um, It drives me bonkers uh, to see like kind of the clumsy communication to different audiences. And there's been a lot of attention, particularly on misogyny and racial issues and in the last several weeks. And there's been a lot of debates, you know, on the beer forums and you know, there's there's a lot of clumsy, you know, attempts at humor, satire that kind of fall flat. Um, for me, sometimes that's offensive. Sometimes it's just stupid. But watching kind of the equivocation and the defending of it inside some of the social groups and the closed Facebook groups, mm. that's what I find infuriating. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not familiar with this world. What you guys all get together in Facebook groups, all the you- Craft brewers well, no, and, there, there's mm-hmm. a lot of enthusiast uh, Facebook groups, so people yeah. who are traders, collectors. Um, and then there's just the general social media. I mean, when there's, you know, we had an issue probably about a month ago where we had a free ad that someone had offered because they were a fan of City Football Club of like a, you know, a, a broadsheet, just a paper called the Great Lakes Brewing News. And the owner publisher had published what he had said was a satire, but it was like incredibly insensitive, misogynistic piece, oh. kind of like a Neanderthal satire. And I actually I actually think he intended it as a satire, but it was horrible. Yeah. And so, you know, it caught our attention pretty quickly. Uh, and 
you know, it was something we wanted to distance ourselves from, but also kind of, you know, start talking about those issues. Um, you know, and I think it's, um, I think it's interesting. It's, um, you know, we will see, I'm very comfortable personally taking whatever heat comes my way. I mean, we definitely are not, we're not a corporation. So, you know, if we put out a beer called Very Stable Genius, um, yeah, there's not going to be a bunch of guys with MAGA hats in our tap room. We know that. We're conscious of it. It's Ferndale. There's not going to be a bunch of guys with MAGA <laughs> no, hats we, in we your tap room. No, we know who we yeah. are. And, and so, you know, we can have some fun with it. Um, but in the same token, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of private emails about, you know, you know, using less than thrilling, you know, language about – our association with the LGBT community, where this kind of brewery or that kind of brewery, um, you know, we, we had a great story about a week before we opened. We had we got our flag poles in, and so we we had a Detroit City Football Club flag, a Pride flag, and a Canadian flag actually because. <laughs> We hadn't gotten an American flag, didn't come in with the Amazon order. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and my wife is Canadian. You got to get Prime. It's two-day shipping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and for some reason, like they the American of- flag was back ordered, right? <laughs> okay. So we had put the flags mm, up. Probably a rally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we had put the flags up. And on my um, personal Facebook Messenger, I got this note from this random person who said, you know, I've been waiting for this place to open for the last, you know, year. And I am so appalled when I saw those flags go up. Um, I know this is the kind of place that I'll never step foot in. Shame on you. And so I was like, wow, okay, that's pretty heavy. And I'm like, obviously, he saw, you know, something in cranes or whatever. He figured out who I was and got to me. And, and so I'm like, how do I even respond to that? Right. Um, and I, so I just wrote back. I'm like, very sorry to hear that. I'm just curious. Why do you hate soccer so much? Because <laughs> there's a Detroit City football club. Right, place. right, right. And the response was, you don't, you know damn well that's not what the flag I'm talking about. But now while you're at it, I do hate soccer. It's for blank. And I hate Canada while we're at it. And I was like, what? I was like, this is awesome. Like we're by putting up a couple of flags, we just figured out who we don't want here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Keep keep the riff raff out. <laughs> yeah. So it was it was really funny. So there are times, you know, I, I I you know, I'll get beat up over the social justice warrior memes. But um but you know, I we have a zero tolerance environment for any harassment. Um, you know, it's we don't really have a bros being bros thing, you know, mm-hmm. um, and we don't really see a lot of it. We'll occasionally get the bachelor party bus that drops off and, you know, it, make the bartenders uncomfortable. But mm. usually we cut people off and move them along. Yeah. All right. Danny, you ready to play a little game? I love games. All right. We're going to ask you for a series of rapid fire recommendations. Just tell us the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, starting with this, there's a fantastic bike path that leads right to your tap room. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were to go biking, where do you like to go biking? Uh, from my house in Pleasant Ridge, down Livernoy, cutting through Palmer Park, down Hamilton, into Boston Edison and Midtown, Belle Isle, around and back. That's a that's a nice route. Yeah, right that's there. a great yeah. route. Yeah. What's a Detroit activity that's next on your to-do list when you can get away from the tap room? <clears throat> Detroit activity. Um, usually on Sunday mornings or Saturday mornings, my son and I will go down. We'll have bagels at Detroit Bagel. And then we either go to Easter Market and usually head out to Belle Isle because there's a play structure that he thinks is like a Ninja Warrior structure. Oh, nice. Or we'll put a bike in the car and we'll ride on the Tequinder Cut. Very cool. Nice. Uh, where's your favorite place for a business lunch? Um, <laughs> business lunch. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't do those anymore. Uh, no, yeah, you're, 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 um, my, you're still a little bit of a suit. I do, I do a lot of breakfast, um, late breakfast, and fly trap in Ferndale mm. yeah, is my jam. Or if I'm, I'm doing lunchtime, uh, one of the two Emas. Oh, yeah. Restaurant of the year. Yeah. What's your favorite place to see a concert? Uh, I love the I, I love the Fox for something a little bigger. Um, 
But I'm a St. Andrews Hall man. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. If you could create a beer tale named after any famous Detroiter, and I guess you could. <laughs> So this is a real question. This yes. is not a hypothetical. I get, I, I get that kind of power. Yeah. Uh, who would it be and what would be in it? Mm. Ooh. Um, it's funny. We did a really big kind of chocolatey barley wine that we mm. called Soul Miner. And it was kind of an homage to James Jamerson, the bass player in the Funk Brothers. Oh, sure. And because when we just – it just when we drank this, it reminded of – us of kind of that baseline from Papa was Rolling Stone. So I would uh, I would do something called the Jamerson, and we would maybe have a little coffee, maybe something aged in a whiskey barrel, um, but something that just reminded me of that that baseline for me, the Bernadette Funky. or uh, Papa was Rolling Stone. Nice. So you renovated a tool and die shop into the Livernoy Tap Room. <laughs> if you could pick another building renovation project of some gem in Detroit, what building would it be? Oof. And what Before would you make? Before we bought the building on Livernoy, um, we looked at the John King Number no. 2 uh, bookstore, uh-huh. which is on Cass over by Wayne State. Yep. And it's an old Firestone Tire building. It's so awesome. But they're going to probably knock it down and make a parking lot. Oh, darn. Oh. I don't like to hear that. It's such a cool building. There's like a ramp that goes inside and kind of wraps around. Oh, it's wow. Beautiful. Uh, you're a marketing guy. Do you have a favorite marketing campaign by a Detroit local business over the years that you just think resonated? Wow. That is a tricky one. Um, You know what? Um, It's going to sound kind of silly, but I I loved the – and I'm not like a country music guy. I'm not a truck guy. But Chevy trucks like a rock work. Um, when Campbell Ewald did it. Oh, yeah. Um, if you remember, do you remember the dad and the daughter and the ski team? And, oh, you know, yeah, the, yeah, just, yeah. Just the, the, all the derivatives of that, like, rock campaign, m- mainly as a marketer and advertiser because I think it just crushed the mark. I think it was beautiful. I so thought he was going to say Dietrich first. <laughs> <laughs> Dietrich first. Yeah, he looks like a fur guy. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, what's the biggest misconception you think still exists about Detroit and Metro Detroit? Um, This won't be a popular answer, but I would say um, the misconception right now is that um, problems are solved, man. It's rocking. It's hip. It's chefs should move here. Artists should move here. It's cheap. It's awesome. We have massive infrastructure problems. We have an education system, you know, on the verge of collapse. We, the neighborhood I grew up in, a six mile evergreen, um, is one of the roughest neighborhoods in North America. Um, we have so much work to do. We've barely scratched the surface. And so when I see, you know, the feel-good BS pieces in Bon Appetit or Food and Wine or the New York Times, you know, used to kind of be a little proud. Now I'm kind of annoyed. Yeah. Because the real work has to be done. There's a ton to do. Dig underneath, yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you put at the top of that list? I mean, you know, especially being in Ferndale, I hear about things like regional transit, but mm-hmm. also the... Regional transit, the education system, mm-hmm. um, you know, continued infrastructure development. Um, I think we are very fortunate, and we talked about this a little bit before the interview, to have you know, a huge presence from the Knight Foundation, from Kellogg and Kresge, and from Hudson Weber. And those foundations, you know, have definitely fueled a lot of growth. Um, My partner, Carolyn, has a a charity called Brilliant Detroit, Mm. um, that they're building homes in neighborhoods to create um, early child development centers. Um, There's just so much work. All right. Dan Riley of Axel Brewing and Livernoy Tap. Thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, sharing all your knowledge and passion. Th- thanks for having me. Yeah. This was great. The Livernoy Tap Room is at 567 Livernoy in Ferndale. You've got some events coming up as well, yeah. right? Yeah, we do. This <clears throat> this weekend, we are uh, we, we affectionately say taking back St. Patty's. So if you're not into the green beer and barf and beads and brawls and boobs and everything else that <laughs> St. Patty's well, Some of that become. I'm into. Yeah, Seth is like, well, <laughs> yes, no, yeah, yeah. maybe. If yeah. you want to have a great plate of corned beef and 
a good hour stout in a civilized environment and tell some stories. Our, you know, ours is a place to be. And you'll have a good mixtape. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Always a good mixtape. Yeah. Flogging Molly and Dropkick Murphy. You, right. you may see a little bit of that, right. too. Yeah. You may get into some deeper cuts. And Saw Doctors. Saw, Saw Doctors. Look at that. Check, I don't know this. Are they like the spin doctors? They're, they're like no. the Huey Lewis in the news of Ireland, I yeah, think. Oh, kind of wow. like the pop, Irish that, pop. That was yeah. not the greatest sell. Um, <laughs> We also uh, on 326 we got a nine uh, a 90s trivia event oh. coming up, and then on uh, 413 we've got drag queen story time. Oh, I saw for the that. kids. Yeah, yeah, we were inspired by the folks in Huntington Woods. Yes, and, that's uh, where, where I'm from. My friend Joyce Crom brought that. Yeah, yep. we're looking forward to it. We've got some of the people who were involved there, and uh, we hope we we get great support from the community and. I would more than welcome the annoying protesters because I think they help send a message to the kids as well. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just looking forward to the weather being warm enough that I can bike over Oh, there. me too. Oh. I love biking to your place. So. We are so ready to open up those giant doors. I you bet. have no idea. I bet. We need to breathe. Dan Riley, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fantastic. I appreciate it, guys. Cheers. And thanks for the beer. Cheers. Yes. So good. Until next time, Detroit's moving. Keep up. The D. Brief. Your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene.